least some people are there have joined. We want some more time or can we start? No matter. No matter. Start, no? Yes, okay. ma'am. Right. Okay. Uh, so I am Dr. Jayadri Ranatunda. I am the consultant at Tragama STD Clinic. Uh, then uh, this is your reproductive module, as I uh, know for a few years. And uh, I am supposed to tell you how the sec sexually transmitted infections and HIV both of these, day, uh, the HIV is also a sexually transmitted disease, but uh, for the ordinary, you know, explanations and all, we take them separately. Uh, so sexually transmitted infections and HIV, how it affect the, uh, the reproductive system. But I, I don't think that we can, uh, we can do a very comprehensive kind of uh, thing during two hours, but at least what you should study, uh, I will uh, explain to you. Uh, so. When you consider sexually transmitted infections, are you all in uh, which year? Have you finished the STD appointment by now? Uh, not everyone, madam. Not everyone, okay. Uh, so for the people who have attended the STD appointment, uh, it would be easier uh, to understand. But the others also, I will uh, explain it. So we'll uh, go to the, uh, to explain. This is actually a very basic slide of uh, explaining what uh, what do you mean by STIs? Uh, it has a very major public health problem. Uh, now when you compare with Corona, so you may think that this is nothing. Uh, but what it causes, I mean, the effects of STIs are uh, actually uh, not as you think. So because it causes mental and physical, both involvements in the mental uh, and the physical and social, economical and all these uh, factors, can be affected uh, by the uh, sexually transmitted infection, especially HIV. Uh, so in uh, Sri Lanka also, it's the same thing, uh, but uh, the, mostly the private sector uh, uh, contribute to the management of STIs in Sri Lanka. It's because our people do not like to go to the, uh, the uh, government sector uh, thinking that they will be looked upon badly like uh, stigma and discriminated and looked upon badly and sometimes the doctors might scold them, the nurses might scold them uh, because it happens in some places but it should not be like that. So actually uh, a great majority of patients, about 85% uh, seek the treatment in the private sector for the sexually transmitted infections. Uh, but uh, the, we can't give any treatment in the private sector for HIV. Nobody can. Uh, so because the medicines are only available with the government sector. Why do we want to get the patients into the system in the government sector? Uh, otherwise, we can't get an assessment of the burden of STIs uh, for Sri Lanka. We have no statistics uh, coming from the private sector. Maybe in developed countries, they have the system and all the patients get registered and their data are being shared by the various sectors. But here there's no arrangement like that. And actually what we see here is only a fraction of the, uh, the STI burden in Sri Lanka. So uh, the other problem is the private sector uh, if it is done by the people who are working in the, uh, the STD campaign, it, uh, we will be at and uh, manage the patients well. But we have seen a lot of shortcomings in managing the STIs. Because of this uh, problem of people going, uh, people prefer, prefer to go to uh, the people who are treated secretly and with secret methods and all. So the non-medical people, non-medical in the sense some other uh, people who are not qualified people, uh, we have observed many people treat some diseases, uh, some uh, STIs, uh, especially herpes infection, because we as uh, the people who are trained in this field, we say that the herpes is not a, uh, not a very severe uh, infection and you can't predict whether you will have a recurrence or not and when we will have the recurrence. So we can't predict. So like that, so, but there are people who are telling that I can cure uh, uh, herpes 
and they take a lot of money from the poor patients. So this is the other problem. Why do we are, uh, why are we, uh, why, I mean, we are, uh, we do like if the patients come into the clinics. Uh, so investigations are also limited uh, in the private sector because you can't examine a smear then and there and give the results and give the treatment unlike in a government clinic so basically even if i go to the private sector it's kind of a syndromic treatment like i i guess and give treatment we, we all have to do that unless the investigations are available at hand so the clinics uh, we can give a etiological diagnosis at least in the next uh, next day so after doing the VDRL and all, but some clinics they have the uh, they have the facility to, uh, especially in Colombo uh, National Program, Colombo State Clinic, they can give the get the VDRL result very quickly. Uh, so like that, uh, the facilities are more in the government sector for STI. So this is uh, basic information. Uh, if somebody asked you about uh, what is called, if this is a Samaja Roga, because earlier it was called like uh, Samaja Roga. Even our clinics were named as Samaja Roga Sayanin. But uh, we actually removed that uh, term because it's so discriminating uh, to people. They don't like to go to that places in the government sector, Samaja Roga Sayanin. So they also now also they ask, what have you done in Samaja Roga? So then if we say yes, then they are very depressed. So what do we mean by sexually transmitted infections is diseases which are mainly transmitted sexually. So uh, the, the sentence uh, does mean that there are other methods also for transmission for some of the diseases. Uh, some diseases are actually made only transmitted sexually. But as you know, the other, there's congenital uh, syphilis, congenital, this uh, neonatal gonorrhea and all, they are transferred from mother to the child. Likewise, there are other ways of transmission also, but they are mainly transmitted sexually. So uh, we are a, a developing country or a middle uh, developed country. Uh, so this uh, huge burden of STIs also affects our country because of the, the for the medicines we have to spend a lot of money for HIV medicines and also it affects our economy also. Uh, so when we were medical students HIV was not in the picture actually. Uh, we didn't know anything about HIV as, a, as medical students uh, because it uh, actually uh, the first patient was diagnosed in 1986 and only the textbooks, uh, not our textbooks, but the, the some of these um, uh, these articles and all uh, had the we had a glimpse of HIV, but it was not a uh, disease to uh, to you know to consider even in the differential diagnosis. But now it is changed. So with the HIV epidemic, the STI has also gained some importance uh, when compared to the situation before. Uh, there was a clinic in Colombo uh, that that was in not in the same place where it is now on the other side of the road. So it was called uh, this de, this decay cam this decay camera or something. Uh, now there is a program uh, some uh, uh, program also no in the TV this decay camera the but the this second you are not looking at that. <laughs> so it was the uh, the number given to the STD clinic. So now we all have decided not to put the same number. So for example, my clinic is clinic number is number seventy. Uh, so, because it's so stigmatizing to come to our clinics also, we are also sometimes stigmatized uh, because uh, I have observed that in the private sector, sometimes the patients say not to put my specialty. So, they find it very uneasy to uh, sit in front of my room. Uh, so, like that, uh, all the people working and the diseases all are looked upon in a, uh, in a bad way. But uh, to, to be frank with you all, you all also does. And uh, now you are uh, sexually mature enough to understand. Uh, the sex is also a primary human. Uh, I mean, it, it is a necessary thing, the sexual pleasure. Uh, so we are different from animals because of our uh, special behavior as humans. But still, the humans also, we uh, the, all the humans, I think, are bound to 
uh, acquire their animal status on and off, on and off, or when they are, their minds are not very um, uh, controlled, so they can they can always go wrong according to the criteria set by the society. This is all according to the criteria set by the society. So you should not look upon badly on people. This is uh, actually uh, something maybe extra to the lesson, but that is the most important thing you should uh, have in your minds, not to look look upon badly for, uh, upon the patients with STIs. Okay? So I will call this diseases STIs hereafter. It's easy. Uh, so this is important to identify the diseases because they can, they can infect the or if it is partners, then the spread is more. Uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes are, are very high. That is why this module is also in, uh, inclusive in your uh, the syllabus. Right? They can lead to ectopic pregnancies, spontaneous abortions and stillbirth, premature births, congenital and perinatal infections, puerperal maternal infections, and increased risk of HIV transmission and acquisition. To explain the last one, uh, any person who is having a STI, maybe an ulcerative STI or maybe a discharging STI, because of the inflammatory process in the epithelium uh, lining of the of the uh, the affected organ, so there is a uh, more viral secretion. If the person is affected with HIV, uh, then there is a increased transmission. In the other hand. If they have inflammatory process in the epithelial surface and the, the receptor cells are more in the epithelium and they can acquire HIV easily, more easily than an uninfected person. So managing STDs properly is one way of uh, controlling the HIV epidemic. And they are, the people might get highly stigmatized and discriminated, therefore may not seek medication. Uh, so they have, as I told you, economical, medical, non-medical, the social and maybe educational and all the, uh, the effects of, the, of a disease. It's uh, like now uh, you can observe how these uh, people getting COVID also getting a little bit of uh, discrimination and, uh, and uh, stigmatization. So that's why I'm telling all my colleagues now, do you understand that? meaning of this uh, stigma, stigma and uh, discrimination because some people avoid getting a test because of that. With that mind, they wait at home. So that is the, uh, the bad effect of stigma and discrimination. But uh, COVID might uh, go off in a uh, few days, but the HIV, if you are infected, then the risk is there for your life. So the presentation of STIs may be like a genital ulcer or a vaginal discharge in females. The vaginal discharge may be due to the cervicitis or the vaginitis and urethral discharge in males, scrotal swelling in males, low abdominal pain uh, and anal discharge. Uh, so low abdominal pain is due to the ascending infection to the, uh, the uterus and the uh, the surrounding structures and pelvic peritoneum can. So uh, the low abdominal pain is mainly due to uh, some, most of the time is due to pelvic inflammatory disease. Maybe you have had your lessons on pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, so the STIs contribute to uh, PID in a major way. Uh, so anal discharge, why anal discharge? So as you all are adults, again, I'm telling you, so anal sex is also a way of having uh, sex. So sex is not only uh, pain or vaginal sex, you know, with uh, the people, the males who are having sex with males. So they use the anus or the this as a uh, sexual uh, organ and they insert the penis into the anus of their partner. Uh, and then uh, uh, the anal canal is not, uh, not a sexual organ, uh, by itself, uh, because there's no uh, lubrication uh, as it doesn't have the lubricative abilities. And then the trauma is more 
and HIV transmission is more. That is why the Sri Lankan epidemic now, Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, the HIV epidemic is actually mainly run by the men who are having sex with men. Okay. Uh, remember, not with uh, the women who are having sex with women. That is, they, they do not in, uh, the, uh, engage in many risky behaviors like the males. So, anal discharge is uh, if somebody, anybody is having an anal discharge, please consider a STI, low abdominal pain, also the same. So, what's in the genital area, genital warts, and eye discharge in neonates. So, these are the, uh, the main ways of presenting. Uh, of the uh, the people who are having a sexually transmitted infection. But remember, this is not the majority. The majority of people are asymptomatic during a, uh, a long time of the illness. A major uh, duration of the disease is asymptomatic. So they will not know that they are having a disease. So because of this asymptomatic nature, uh, the partner or partners do not identify, not only the partners, but the patient also doesn't know that he or she is having a disease, transsexually transmittable disease. So then asymptomatic transmission can happen. So it is our duty to identify the hidden diseases also. So some diseases we can, but unfortunately some diseases uh, we can't identify the asymptomatic stage. So when we go, I will explain. So the STIs which are prevalent in Sri Lanka are, you know these their names, I think, gonorrhea, also the Bindumai in Sinhala, uh, syphilis, uh, or Upadansha in Sinhala, uh, syphilis. Uh, it is caused by the, the, tri, uh, the it is, uh, um, sorry, uh, these are bacterial diseases. And then uh, Trepanema peridum, there's a subspecies, subspecies pallidum. Uh, and it is called Upadansha in Sinhala. And you get this variety called non gonococcal urethritis or cervicitis. Uh, but uh, non gonococcal, uh, if it is, even if it is non gonococcal, in the developed countries, there are methods of diagnosing. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, in the peripheral kidneys, but uh, in some, uh, sometimes the, the tests are available in the Colombo STD clinic, the National Reference Laboratory is situated there. Uh, so non gonococcal only we, what we can say is there's a urethritis, but it is not gonorrhea because we stain and see no gonorrhea, but there's a urethritis by the cell count we assess cervicitis also by the cell count we assess but there are some few organisms responsible for urethritis and cervicitis so uh, what we do is then we uh, take the most common ones gonorrhea and chlamydia and we treat with for both infections together that is solely because we do not have a test to detect chlamydia and uh, the most common one is actually now in these days is genital herpes and uh, genital warts also very common. Gonorrhea and syphilis are actually going down. Uh, so I can remember when we were medical students, at any given time, there would be about uh, six, seven syphilis patients at, with any stage of syphilis and gonorrhea, many patients with gonorrhea awaiting uh, penicillin injections. Uh, so penicillin injections are very commonly used in those days. That is, I'm talking about 1980, 85, 84 life. Uh, so then uh, now the treatment and everything is different now. Uh, why we don't see many gonorrhea cases, but we see syphilis cases. Uh, gonorrhea, why it is very rare? Maybe because the organism also may have changed the characteristics. And on the other hand, uh, the antibiotic use is very common now for very minor illnesses also. Uh, the people are given uh, cefuroxime, uh, this any class of uh, cefuroxime. So then uh, that is partially treated. That is the main reason. And genital herpes is very common because it is a viral disease. What's also common? And lymphogranuloma venereum, chancroid and granuloma inguinale, we don't see it here commonly. Uh, very rarely we can see lymphogranuloma venereum. But I also didn't see for a long, long time 
uh, the patients come in with lymphogranuloma venereum. But we have to be careful as the Indian workers are coming and working here, they can have these uh, STIs with them. So they uh, go to the Sri Lankan sex workers and they can get it. And the locals also, there's a chance of seeing these diseases, uh, but still we haven't seen them uh, off. So uh, I don't know whether this is necessary or not. Uh, it's the syndromic management. I told you that sometimes I also have to do a syndromic management because when there are no diagnostic facilities to come to an etiological diagnosis, we uh, treat the syndrome. Like if you have a urethral discharge, then we treat the, without coming to an etiological diagnosis, we treat the, we treat for gonorrhea and chlamydia. If there is a genital ulcer, if you can come to a clinical diagnosis, then you can treat, but it is warranted to give treatment for herpes uh, and syphilis, both. Those are the two kinds of uh, common uh, STIs. So the syndromic management uh, differs between uh, different different countries because it depends on the, the country prevalence and other factors. So that is called the STD, uh, syndromic management. But uh, sometimes in Sri Lanka, in uh, very uh, remote areas of Sri Lanka, you don't get even a microscope in the STD clinic. So then it is completely all right to treat the patient according to the syndrome because you will reduce the infectivity and the complications. Uh, so there are benefits of treating syndromically. Some uh, bad effects are you are over treating and the cost is more and there are these uh, things also. So it's a, uh, it solely depends on the facilities you have and the, your clinical knowledge. So these are the syndromes, like I told you, the presentation. So these are presentations. If somebody presents with this, I will treat with this drug. So there is a syndromic management uh, guideline also with us, but uh, we are not actually giving a syndromic management in the clinic setting because almost all the clinics do have the microscopic facility to identify the treponemes, to identify the uh, gonococci and uh, the Colombo clinic has the chlamydia, VDRL, TPPA, HIV, all are available with us. So uh, HIV is not included in the syndromic management as you all can understand. So we treat, uh, but uh, there are some uh, instances where you will have to use the syndromic management. And the low abdominal pain, uh, vaginal discharge and dyspareunia. Uh, so that is called the low abdominal pain syndrome. And that is also being treated for uh, sometimes uh, intravenous or intramuscular injections of ceftriaxone and uh, metronidazole and doxycycline. So these are some of the things we do just to explain you what we are doing. And ophthalmia and neonatorum syndrome, if a newborn is presented with, uh, is brought to your clinic with the eye discharge, if there's a clear parulent discharge, then you will not wait for the investigations even to, uh, to prove that it is gonorrhea. You have to treat the baby with the suspicion in your mind because gonococcal uh, conjunctivitis is a, is a disease which can lead the child to a, is a newborn to uh, blindness, uh, lead the newborn to blindness. So we have to be very careful if a, a newborn is presented to uh, with uh, eye discharge, purulent eye discharge. So and coming to the most common disease, how it affects the pregnancy. So you know this is a uh, some history, I will not waste time. So the biology, there are over 100 herpes viruses identified, but we are interested about eight of them. Uh, so, and especially in the STD clinics, uh, we are interested in HSV1 and HSV2. Both the types can cause genital or oral, oral labial herpes. Contrary to the popular belief that uh, HSV1 causes uh, oral labial herpes and HSV2 causes genital herpes, uh, both the types can cause the uh, ulcers in both places. So the, all these viruses, so uh, HSV3 is, as you know, it's a variolar uh, virus which causes chickenpox. 4 is the cytomegalovirus, 
five is the Epstein Barr virus, six and seven are Rosiola infantum, and uh, number eight is the uh, the virus causing Kaposi sarcoma, which is a cancer mainly found in HIV positive people. So about eight of these uh, herpes viruses infect humans. And in the STD clinic, mostly we are interested about type one and two. Uh, common feature of all is the cytopathic effects in the cell during infection. And there is cellular, they destroy the cell. That is why the ulcers are occurring. And at the same time, they can establish latency. So even if the ulcers are healed, the virus can remain in the, uh, the uh, neural, uh, neural tissue in the ganglion. They can lay dormant uh, and cause recurrent, inf recurrent attacks of herpes with ulcers. So it, uh, they will not be as severe as the first infection. Uh, the primary or the first uh, episode is very severe, uh, but the later on it becomes a very uh, low intensity. Uh, but the patients are very worried about the, this uh, reappearance of ulcers. So that has to be uh, managed with the knowledge and with the, uh, with the uh, good mind. Because our main aim is to, now if a couple comes with herpes, then uh, we have to uh, counsel them so as they will, uh, be, they will uh, keep the marriage intact. Uh, so, because it is a, uh, it is a need to, to uh, keep the marriage intact. So, it's a thing between, but you should not, you can separate, but still herpes should not be the cause for separation. That is what I uh, look at them. Herpes should not be the cause for separation. There may be other factors, uh, but uh, for that uh, counseling, you have to have a good knowledge about Herpes. Otherwise, everything goes in vain and they go to and end up with divorce cases. And sometimes poor me also has to go to courts and wait for to give evidence, which is not helping any one of them. It is uh, completely scientifically given and it will not help any of them. Uh, so this is like this. We can't predict at what time it will come and what time it will uh, the recurrences occur. Some people do not get any recurrences and whether the partner will get infected or sometimes they may not get uh, infected. So all these are unpredictable things. So then the people take the advantage and they predict and they say that they can cure herpes and put poor people in trouble. Uh, then the transmission is only by a close contact with the person who is shedding the virus. So uh, what you have to take from this uh, sentence is uh, there may be people who are shedding the virus, but they are not having symptoms. So a person who is not having any ulcer or any discharge or anything might uh, can, uh, there is a possibility that they might shed the virus. So uh, you can't say that I, I, had, I have not had any uh, ulcers so far in my life. So, but you got the ulcers. So this is from somebody else, not from me. There are these, uh, the, these are the main complaints of the people. Sometimes not the pain, not the ulcers, but the, uh, the thinking that there is a third person there. Uh, so the virus can shed from a peripheral site or uh, mainly from the mucosal surfaces, so genital or oral secretions. So these oral secretions, you have to learn that uh, you may have seen the little kids having uh, small, small blisters and ulcerations in their mouth. So that is actually herpes simplex type 1, uh, mostly type 1, but the type 2 also can cause, but they have not acquired it sexually, but because of the uh, very close association with the friends. Uh, in the in the uh, childhood, they can get the infection, but the problem is it will solve. But as an adult, also you there is a liability to shed the virus on and off. So if these people, as adults, engage in oral sex with their partners, it can spread to the genitals, and we diagnose it as genital herpes. But actually, there is no third person in between. Uh, them. Uh, very difficult to explain this, but you have to take time and explain because it will uh, save to people from severe mental stress and uh, marriage and maybe for kids, you are saving a 
marriage, a mother and a father. Uh, so then uh, these things have to be handled very uh, with knowledge and with empathy. Okay, this is not sympathy actually for people. For patients, we should have empathy. I think you know the difference between sympathy and empathy. Uh, uh, in, if in single I say sympathy is anepahu, aparadi, haridukha, yoagana and all that is sympathy. But empathy is not that. Uh, okay, I can understand what you are undergoing. But this is like this. Uh, if uh, you are in this position, you have to work like this. So that is empathy. Then you feel for the person, but it's there's no sympathy. So the cellular changes, I told you that the cells can be destructed and the vesicles are formed and there's an inflammatory base. So uh, if you scrape the ulcer base and look at look under the microscope, there may be multinucleated or giant cells, focal cellular necrosis with cell destruction. So that is why the ulcers occur. And in the clinic, uh, we can look for these multinucleated or giant cells under the microscope. And sometimes we use this to diagnose. Most of the time, to tell you uh, frankly, it is a clinical diagnosis because uh, there are uh, tests like uh, we can test the antibody level and all, but antibody level will not help you to diagnose the disease. It is done only in certain circumstances to check whether the, uh, the, person, the patient is having antibodies in their blood. Mainly if a pregnant woman is uh, uh, having a past history of herpes or uh, uh, this thing, then we have to uh, test whether the woman is having enough antibodies to protect the baby getting infected at the time of delivery. So for that purpose, we sometimes do the antibody levels, uh, but some people do antibody levels without any, uh, any uh, basis for it. Then the whole picture sometimes can get uh, can get uh, you know it's, it can be a stress for the uh, care provider also because in interpreting these results it's not very easy uh, you can do it if you don't have any knowledge also just uh, looking at the term positive and negative but it should not be the case so they are not uh, if at all if you can do a HSV DNA PCR so that will be the best test if you can do. So that is diagnostic of the herpes ulcer. Okay. And uh, earlier there were this uh, HSV uh, antigen and all uh, the test in the culture and antigen testing in the MRI, but unfortunately nothing is available now. So uh, we all have to depend on the HSV DNA PCR. Remember, it is not available in the usual settings in the government clinics, but it is available in the private sector. The cost is around 10,000 rupees for the test. But if you are uh, sure, sometimes we can say that I'm 100% sure, but there's a little bit of uh, this thing also. But for our judicial cases, sometimes uh, it is important to prove that it is herpes. Without any proof, what we can say is it looked like herpes, that's all. Uh, clinically, it uh, it was like a so for these purposes HSC DNA PCR is a uh, very good test to diagnose not the serology okay so this is how it uh, it trans like uh, the skin uh, when there are ulcers it will travel to the nerves and then uh, in that sense so they will go and settle in the uh, So the virus gains, I will show you the picture. So like this, it will settle in the, uh, the, neuro, uh, the neuronal, uh, this, uh, sometimes in the synapses, and then uh, they will travel back into the same surface. So then uh, they will um, cause ulcers when they travel back. So there are some uh, instances where uh, this, uh, what is called recurrence is aggravated. Like sometimes during menstruation, 
or sometimes with uh, childbirth, with pregnancy, uh, with fevers, uh, with vaccination, sometimes they can trigger the uh, recurrence rate of herpes. Okay, so this is the, the basis of recurrences and sensory neurons and latent infection is established and uh, the antibodies are formed and it will uh, prevent the spread of the virus. So that is why the antibodies are important but not in the diagnostic purposes. Mm -hmm. and the manifestations are ulcers and pain, painful ulcers, discharge from the ulcers. It may be due to HSV1 or HSV2. Uh, maybe due to HSV1 or HSV2. And uh, remember, I told you about the subclinic infections. Many infections are subclinical. So only about 20% of the people who get HSV present with ulcers. About 60% are asymptomatic or subclinical. The rest of the 20% present with, not with ulcers and pain, but maybe with the uh, pain along the leg, uh, sometimes or vulval pain and these situations are also there. Many infections are subclinical. The severity of the disease is generally more in HSV type 2 infections. So if you can type, then the severity is more in HSV type 2. Uh, primary infections are called absent antibodies are severe because there are no antibodies available to curb the, the effects of the infection. Uh, so the initial episode also something like the primary infection, uh, they are also very severe when compared to the recurrent attacks. Uh, so they present with the most commonly they present with multiple painful vesicovascular ulcerative lesions in genital areas. They come with severe pain, mainly women present with the very severe pain in the vulva. They are unable to pass urine and it is a severe agony and you must uh, look at the patient in a very, uh, then the sympathy also can count, okay? So should not say, uh, uh, don't shout, I want to examine and all, and you separate the, uh, the leg sensor. You have to be very, uh, very, very mild. And then uh, just looking at it will suffice actually. If I have the HSAD and your PCR testing, then you can take a swab band send it. Otherwise, it's proper cleaning, vulval cleaning uh, with, uh, with saline water, uh, but with enough uh, pain, uh, pain management. So what we do is we don't anesthetize and uh, clean people or do this uh, any uh, local anesthesia, but we uh, put some lignocaine gel over the area to temporarily anesthetize surface. Or we put a voltar in uh, suppository also sometimes. Uh, it will reduce the pain but not completely cut off the pain. Then they will realize with washing the pain reduces. Then they will not object to cleaning. Otherwise, it's a real messy process. What we do uh, is to ask the patient herself to sit on a basin full of uh, salt, added, uh, salt added water and we give the quantity. It's just the taste of salt not with a lot of salt, uh, then they, she has to do the, uh, the cleaning the, between the labia minora and majora. And uh, the self-cleaning is what is actually easy to do. Then with each washing here that, and with a cyclic treatment, the pain will pass off. So there can be uh, invinal lymphadenopathy associated with it. Mysuria is very severe. And vaginal discharge can occur due to uh, vaginal involvement, sometimes a cervical involvement or urethral discharge in males some, most of the time. And pharyngeal infection also can present as a sore throat, uh, the pharyngeal infection due to oral sex. Uh, so this is the typical picture of herpes blisters. They are water-filled blisters and they can break and form into ulcers like this. Uh, these ulcers, if it happens in a male also, I'm not telling that it is not painful, but a woman uh, suffers a lot uh, due to the position and the, the number of ulcers and everything. Uh, so these are some of the sites where we have seen ulcers. Uh, in the female vulva, it's not a very severe 
severely affected valva so the uh, glands and the pupils can get affected so blisters may be like this and oral uh, redness and hyperemia and these things after oral sex with the person should in the virus and maybe perianal then they have anal sex so it depends on the uh, the way uh, the patient has said sex and uh, these are also i have uh, told you i think uh, but they can get is it gingivostomatitis as i told you earlier herpes labialis uh, and uh, keratoconjunctivitis uh, it can affect the conjunctiva so most of the time it is self inoculation they touch the uh, perineal area and they can uh, uh, scratch or touch their eyes so it's a uh, auto inoculation and you can get cutaneous herpes very rarely uh, when there is a generalized uh, skin lesions then you can get a uh, cutaneous herpes that is a very severe infection and genital and uh, genital herpes encephalitis and meningitis and neonatal meningitis and neonatal herpes among uh, the neonates and uh, little ones uh, encephalitis you can get it in adults also uh, adults also it's a transient encephalitis with the uh, anti uh, viral drugs it will just settle on its own uh, what's the main um, dreaded complication of herpes is neonatal herpes and meningitis as i do not have an interaction with you i don't know whether you are listening or whether you all are uh, not giving any attention is that so or am i too far am i listening to my lecture you are listening madam you are listening no okay okay at least you are there okay so uh, meningitis and neonatal herpes are the most dreaded complications of uh, herpes infection you should avoid that it's an avoidable infection and because otherwise these kids may go as cerebral palsy and mental retardation which nobody would like and if a mother is having herpetic ulcers at the time of delivery a cesarean section should be done uh, so that is a must and uh, so complicated management things are there so i'm not going to uh, do everything what is necessary for you only uh, so these are important for your uh, reproductive module uh, so neonatal herpes should be avoided and we can actually avoid it if you take proper histories from mothers uh, not just the uh, uh, the the period of amenorrhea and uh, blah blah uh, so you have to ask the previous history of any ulcers or discharges also so it is a preventable disease uh, there may be complications like adhesion formation in the vulva and then the proper washing is necessary so if there is severe pain urinary retention can happen uh, super infection with fungi or bacteria may occur uh, so and dissemination to a central nervous system liver lungs joints or to cutaneous spread so that is called uh, that is called the systemic herpes okay uh, systemic herpes is also common among people who are immunosuppressed not with the people who are having good immune responses okay uh, so as uh, this have i have been talking to you with uh, viral isolation by culture and just with dna detection by pcr giant cells uh, is the one i told you about the multinucleated giant cells by smear that we can do uh, so serology done on in special circumstances treatment is by acyclovir uh, we can use valacyclovir or famcyclovir also but the latter two are not available in sri lanka now uh, only acyclovir many brands are there so we know what uh, the brand is uh, superior than the other brand but uh, i can't tell these things in a lecture ethically uh, but practically we have identified uh, the what is available in the clinic is not at all good for people patients but uh, we have to give it and if they can afford i always ask them to buy if they can not to support any uh, pharmaceutical corporation or anything but to reduce the pain for the patient so the complications in pregnancy you can read this first trimester miscarriages preterm birth 
growth retardation. Uh, so it can unit like chest pain. It's a very uh, severe, uh, severe infection, neurological complications, and it can affect the eye and the skin, uh, the mouth. So the, this that is the uh, the that is what we want to prevent or the reduce the number of recurrences in pregnancy. So we take all the actions to uh, reduce the number of uh, recurrences in pregnancy by giving a side player from the from. 36 weeks onwards if the patient is having recurrent herpes. Uh, so if you can remember those, uh, the basic things, then it will be enough for you. You should never deliver a patient having active ulcers at the time of delivery. Uh, so these are the things that you have to uh, remember. And if a mother has got uh, herpes, acti act active ulcers, Within four weeks of delivery, again, you have to do a cesarean section. Otherwise, you can assess the antibody level and allow a vaginal delivery. But at the rate that I see the patients are undergoing cesarean sections, I think uh, why there should be this, uh, why don't we undertake cesarean sections for herpes, uh, recurrent herpes people. Uh, should not take any risk because it is a severe infection for the fetus but I am giving you the guideline uh, giving you the guideline so this is what the guideline says uh, so this is uh, explaining what I told you the first episode of this and in the third trimester uh, no inward management needed if uncomplicated if the mother is not vomiting and tolerating oral fluids and also you can send them home it will be easy for them to do uh, washing and all uh, unlike in the war. So, but you have to refer them to STD clinic because there may be some other associated STIs or HIV. So now all the mothers are tested for HIV, but still uh, they can acquire the infection in a later uh, trimester because it is done in the booking visit itself, the HIV test. So they, there is a liability that they can acquire it later. We have to rush a little. Uh, prevention is this. Condoms do not provide 100% protection. Uh, then I come to human papilloma virus that will not cause much effects for the feeders. So you will get lectures on human papilloma virus, I think. Uh, so HPV type 6 and 11 cause the, cause the, uh, the genital warts. At 16 and 18, mainly for uh, causes the cervical cancer. So there's a vaccine now, which includes 6, 11, 16, and 18. So all the young girls are given this before they start their sexual activities. That is why at the age 11, 12, all of the countries give. I also, we don't know at what age the Sri Lankan kids uh, start sexual activities. You may be knowing more than me. Uh, so then uh, anyway, uh, age 11, 12 is okay. Uh, we see many teenage pregnancies also now, uh, so it is all right to give at that age. Uh, so uh, the human papilloma virus is the cause for anal carcinoma, penile carcinoma, cervical carcinoma, vaginal, vulval, all the causes human papilloma virus. Now they have found it. Uh, so actually we also didn't know the cause for cervical cancer is the human papilloma virus. It's only, but now they have proved that almost all these uh, cases are due to human patients. So uh, the cervical cancer rate in Sri Lanka, uh, one of the your professors told me that they identify about 10,000 cases per year, cervical cancers. It will not be so in the future because we are vaccinating. For the other people also, I recommend getting the vaccine. It is not available in the private sector, the government sector free of charge. But for the young girls, we can always ask them to get the vaccine before starting their sexual life. Because you don't know whether your partners are shedding this virus and you can avoid getting a, a carcinoma. So I advise the young girls to get the vaccine. It is called the Gardasil vaccine. Uh, to get the vaccine before they start their uh, sexual life. Uh, so the symptoms are the lumps shown in the area, 
usually the majority are asymptomatic you will not see anything outside and you can get growths in the genital area maybe in the vulva maybe inside the vagina maybe in and around the anus uh, so these are the main areas where the people get genital uh, warts so called genital warts very rarely there are this uh, uh, these things are occurring in the urethra distortion of urine flow and all but usually they are in the vulva or the uh, prepucial area uh, the thing is the patients get very disheartened at the appearance if the appearance is not at all uh, good because uh, it's like a uh, uh, they are very uh, very keen on getting the lesions removed this is the only thing we can do also we can't kill the virus so there is a possibility of getting a recurrence what we can do here is also to get the get the wart out of the skin so to do that actually when it is very high in numbers we also find it very difficult to remove them sometimes in, in the males if it is only in the prepucial sac uh, we can remove that area the skin area surgically and uh, get the warts out of that uh, but otherwise we have to uh, uh, this uh, use many methods of getting them removed including uh, the cryo surgery or cryotherapy with liquid nitrogen or electro surgery electro cute elect with the electro cautery uh, uh, machine needle you can remove them or the simple use of uh, simple use of acid uh, like uh, trichloroacetic acid so this is the appearance of genital warts sometimes so you can uh, uh, you can realize what the patient will be feeling with all these lumps in the uh, their uh, genitals okay. so the diagnosis only by visual inspection uh, biopsy we don't do uh, regularly but if there is bleeding or uh, worsening of symptoms or the the size is increasing so we do a biopsy and see whether there are uh, cancerous changes uh, so these are you the mainly we do the visual inspection and diagnose but for the cervical cancer you know we do the pap smear and diagnose uh, anal pap is not uh, uh, not established in sri lanka uh, but i think we will have to establish it also in near future uh, because the number of people who are having anal sex is also increasing and number of men who are having sex with men is also increasing uh, unfortunately uh, uh, please don't uh, spread the word that i told unfortunately because there are legal and ethical issues also but that is how i feel as a person not as a professional but as a person uh, so the patient is immunocompromised uh, when the disease worsens during therapy or if the patient is immunocompromised then you can do a biopsy and see otherwise no regular biopsies are done treatment uh, there are provider applied uh, ones as well as the patient applied ones so many patients like to get a treatment which can be applied by them uh, we don't have anything to clinics but they can buy uh, imiquimod from outside imiquimod is very expensive a very small sachet cost around 900 rupees uh, podophyllotoxin is now not available in sri lanka uh but we apply we can apply tca trichloroacetic acid in the clinic they have to come weekly for this application and uh, interferons are not available for us uh, physical ablation is by liquid nitrogen as a cryotherapy or electro surgery or excision and laser is or can be done but uh, you know the laser therapy is not available for us so it is mainly the tca application or the Uh, electro surgery or cryotherapy by liquid nitrogen uh, most of the time we can get them removed but the unfortunate scenarios they recur so then i we advise them to come with one or two lesions then it is easy otherwise when they come like that picture so then it is very difficult to uh, get all of them removed and the uh, vaccination i told you there's a gardasil vaccine uh then uh, the interval is like this 
and for our school children we give only two uh, doses uh, uh, one uh, the first dose and then in six months the other dose uh, so before getting sexually exposed so 11 and 12 years we give that vaccine uh, and uh, the effects on uh, the uh, but the reproductive health is one thing that it is very unsightly uh, to have uh, to have bots in the genital area and the people might not marry or if they are married also uh, they will be they will not have sex till their lesions are uh, resolved so there is refusal uh, and then the the many problems can occur due to these unsightly lesions in the genital region and the other thing is if a child is born uh, when the mother is having a uh, number of warts in the vulva vaginal area very 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 rarely the child can get a laryngeal papilloma it's a very very rare incidence to get laryngeal papilloma mostly we try to uh, get the warts removed from removed at the time of pregnancy because when they go for delivery nobody might come and assist them for delivery there will be refusal uh, otherwise after pregnancy they will resolve in size uh, after the delivery but we will not wait till that because of this uh, complication of getting refused uh, for the, uh, at the time of delivery there is no indication to do a cesarean section unless the warts are so severe that it, it is obstructing the uh, vaginal pathway uh, and I have not seen any uh, giant uh, uh, wart obstructing the birth canal. Uh, but I have taken a lot of interest to get the lesions out of the vulva because nobody will touch the vulva to give assistance to the patient during delivery. Uh, those are the effects on uh, the baby and the mother. A baby is getting affected very rare, very, very rare. But sometimes the the children can have a uh, can have a very transient uh, body lesions in their vulva after the delivery. Those also we haven't seen much. And then coming to gonorrhea, uh, this has the effect of uh, uh, causing pelvic inflammatory disease that affects the reproductive health of the patient. Uh, positive autism, Neisseria gonorrhea. This is how it will be seen under the microscope with uh, uh, the with, uh, gram-negative diplococci, uh, intracellular diplococci. So this is very easily identified under the microscope with gram stain. Uh, so gram-negative diplococci, okay? remember. Uh, and it's clear that uh, you need that. And transmission uh, the from only from human to human, uh, survive only for a short time uh, outside the human body, uh, spread this only by mucosal contact. So this uh, human uh, this story, uh, but I have seen some veterinary surgeons, uh, one of my friends, they were telling that it is common with the dogs also. Uh, as I have not studied uh, veterinary surgery, I don't know. So they have identified the the, the, this, uh, the female dogs getting uh, pelvic inflammatory disease due to gonorrhea. That's what they say. This is what the textbooks say. Uh, anyway, uh, it can be solved easily, I think, if they find the uh, do a grand scale with the when they are having the symptoms. So, biology, gram negative diplococci. Um, these other things you can uh, forget actually. There are these surface molecules called pili. They get attached to the cells and then they go inside uh, go inside the epithelium and subepithelial abscesses are called, are caused and these subepithelial abscesses rupture and then the uh, mucosa damage is there. So microabscesses are formed and exudation of purulent material into the lumen. So if that, if that is in the urethra of a male, then uh, parulent discharge will come out of the urethra and it will come out. That is why it is called Sudhabinduma. Uh, and uh, if you have seen one patient, one discharging patient, then you can identify it even without uh, the uh, 
uh, the gram stain, but we have to do the gram stain uh, to come to ideological diagnosis. It's so easy to diagnose. I will show you the pictures. And then this is how the, the pelvic structure, uh, it, can, uh, it can infect the cervix. So cervicitis is the commonest one. And it can go up to the uh, self in uh, the uh, cell, uh, go up and cause self injuritis and uh, ophritis, self ophritis, pelvic inflammatory disease, septicemia, tubo ovarian abscess. So uh, the subfertility is the main complication. And uh, what is this? Um, strictures, ectopic pregnancy. So these are the this is a very important lesson to learn in your, uh, in your uh, reproductive uh, health module. Uh, so complications of gonococcal infection in the reproductive tract is many more. And uh, this abscess formation and stricture formation and blockage giving rise to subfertility and then ectopic pregnancy. So these are the complications of gonococcal infection. And remember, in women, uh, many of them are asymptomatic. But in males, many of them are symptomatic. And again, the males are benefited because uh, when they are symptomatic, they will go and seek treatment. But uh, poor women, they even a mild discharge, they might put to the physiological discharge and wait without getting any treatment. Uh, but not any treatment will also suffice. They should... Uh, attend a, a place where they can do a gram stain and diagnose. Uh, so they are lucky if they can come to a place where they will be given the proper treatment according to the guidelines. So that is completely necessary to treat according to the guidelines. Otherwise, there will be a lot of um, uh, resistant uh, forms of gonococci. Remember these uh, complications. And uh, as I told you, clinically, they might have local complications like discharge, uh, sometimes local complications like Bartholin abscess, and in the penis also, the glands, literous glands, and uh, these Cowper's glands can get affected, and systemic infection very rarely, uh, very rarely. Uh, but I have seen about uh, three or four patients who are having arthritis and um, uh, and there is uh, necrotic ulcers in associated with the joints. So it's not a very common uh, presentation, but uh, it is diagnosed by physicians usually because the patients go to physicians or the rheumatologists. And if they know or have seen about this uh, one of uh, systemic infection, they will uh, detect it. Otherwise, uh, again, go in the natural process. Uh, asymptomatically, the bacterium can lie in the urethra, in the cervix, rectum, or pharynx. So, depending on the, the sexual practice, then they can have the gonorrhea, the bacterium in these places. Uh, so, they can have a urethritis, cervicitis, proctitis, pharyngitis, bartholinitis, or a conjunctivitis. How conjunctivitis? Through, usually through uh, mother to child transmission or auto inoculation. So, they have their, the, uh, the discharge in their fingers at the same time they touch the eye. So, now these days it's not happening because of COVID, but anyway, we have seen adults also uh, getting the uh, conjunctival, uh, conjunctival infection and um, so some people say that some people practice a sexual uh, intercourse they have their own ways of pleasure uh, so they touch the eye with the penis and then also you can get a conjunctivitis so these are some case reports I'm telling you uh, not with everybody uh, the local complications, uh, the pelvic inflammatory disease, dematis, bartholin abscess, lymphangitis, penile abscess, periurethral abscess. So these, if you find any of these complications in your surgery appointment or the gynae appointment, please consider a STI and uh, try to exclude it. 
uh, rather than just giving treatment, uh, you can send them to the STD clinic and get uh, the uh, this uh, uh, the thinking or the the diagnosis, uh, possible diagnosis, get excluded. That is the most important thing. STIs should come under a differential diagnosis. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen most of the time. Uh, now, this is a discharge. So, you can have a close look at the discharge. And if you see this, it's almost always gonorrhea. Okay, so it's a thick yellowish discharge, even though they say it is sudhu bindu, it's not just sudhu, uh, it's a yellowish discharge. And uh, these pictures show you uh, the, uh, the glandular involvement in and around the penis, uh, this, uh, the Tyson's glands, Tyson's, yes. This is an epididymocitis uh, with uh, swelling and redness and vomit in the this uh, testicle, uh, the scrotum. Uh, the testicles are tender, uh, and then you have to give uh, urgent care. Otherwise, abscess formation can happen. Referral to a STD clinic is very important. And tell the don't ever hesitate to take a sexual history from any patient, for that matter, because you all are permitted to take the history. When you are a doctor, even if you are a medical student, you are given permission to ask the history, then sexual history also included in that. So if you ask the history in a way that you are just trying to find some uh, gossip, it will be bad. But if you are trying to do it in a scientific way, the patient will understand and show that it is necessary for a correct diagnosis and they will, most of the time, they will tell the truth unless there is a severe indication for them to hide the fact. So the pregnancy coming to your necessity, uh, in male females, it's mostly asymptomatic. Uh, so, as I said, gram uh, stain smear and the culture should be done. Uh, pelvic inflammatory disease should be excluded in pregnancy. Otherwise, you have to admit the woman and give intravenous therapy. Uh, the baby can develop ophthalmia and neonatorum if the mother has gonococci at the time of delivery in the vagina. And if a child has got infected, it should be treated as an emergency. We don't have many emergencies with venereology, but this is a uh, this is an emergency. And severe PID is an emergency. So we have very limited number of emergencies. So this at least should be treated as an urgent case. Uh, disseminated GC, I told you it is very rare. I will uh, show you a picture. I am having one picture. Uh, so this is uh, about the grand stain and all. I, I don't have a picture in this presentation. Uh, culture we are doing in our labs with the Kaya Martin media. Uh, but now the uh, trend is to go for non-culture tests uh, with uh, nets. So the nets are available not with us in the private sector only. And we do uh, antibiotic susceptibility testing also because uh, time to time, the antibiotic susceptibility, susceptibility changes with gonococci. That is why you have to know the, uh, the present treatment to treat the, the people who are coming these days. Otherwise, your treatment will not be effective. So, these non-culture tests are available. Uh, it's only, uh, I mean, it may not be available uh, to be uh, doing this practice, but maybe in, when you become uh, consultants, uh, hopefully the, these probe test DNA probes and uh, the easy ways of taking specimens, everything will be available. Uh, the treatment depends on the region, depends on the country, uh, country uh, sensitivity detection. So we also change the. We, we, we sometimes get to change that we have to change the regimes. I told you that earlier it was penicillin, then it was uh, tetracycline for some time, then it became uh, then it became triamson. Uh, now it is cefixin. Okay, so we now treat with cefixin, uh, 400 milligrams stat dose or ceftriaxon. This is not 500. I always try to change this and I forget. This is one gram, one gram IM step, ceftriaxone. 
program I am stack. And at the same time, we treat for uh, treat for chlamydia also. Management of sexual partners is very important because you can treat a one index patient and he or she might have sex with their regular partner and again get the infection. There's no immunity associated with this. So the management of sexual partners is very important and the most difficult part. Uh, so the marital partner will be brought sometimes, but not the uh, extramarital or casual partners. Most of the time they don't bring. Uh, the casual partners are booked till they get a disease. For Sri Lankan, uh, usually Sri Lankan men, I'm not talking like this now because I'm female, but the Sri Lankan men are like that. So they love and do careful about their casual partners till they get a disease. After that, at least they are not kind enough to uh, tell them that to get treatment for a possible disease. That is the uh, that is very sad behavior. It is a very uh, bad behavior. Also, I always tell them. So uh, the management uh, of sexual partners is important for the society to prevent the spread as well as for the person who is having the infection. Uh, and this is about the non gonococcal the, It is non gonococcal as we do not have the test to detect these uh, other uh, common organisms like chlamydia, trachomatis, mycoplasma genitalium, and adenoviruses. But we can uh, diagnose trichomonas vaginalis. Uh, we can do a wet smear and diagnose. And HSV also, we can do a DNA PCR and diagnose. So this is about gonorrhea, chlamydia also the same thing actually, same uh, complications but at a lesser degree. Uh, so the chlamydia testing uh, from endocervical urethral smears of the males, it is very easy to use the urine sample. So uh, that we don't have to put the patient on the bed and uh, put a speculum for females and they uh, they are very, uh, you know, they uh, shout uh, when we put the speculum also and taking smears and putting them in the lithotomy position, those are not easy. But for males, again, it's just a urine sample if we have the proper testing, chlamydia test. And for the females also, it is just taking a swab. Self-collected swab is enough for this PCR testing. Treatment, uh, doxycycline is the best actually, 100 twice a day for seven days. And we can give azithromycin also. Azithromycin again, it's not one gram, two grams. That is why I told you that here is sometimes we change our guidelines. So azithromycin two grams already in a single dose. Uh, and 500 milligrams daily for two days. Sorry for my mistake. All of you can write down if you are writing. Uh, you change the slide before I send it to you all. Uh, uh, then uh, coming to syphilis. Uh, I have to do this because it affects the pregnancy. Uh, so I will uh, not to go through this slide. Uh, so syphilis uh, is called Upadansha and it is caused by the bacterium uh, Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum. It's a spirochete actually, it's like it's having a spiral, uh, uh, spiral shape and uh, it has a characteristic modality. It uh, rotates down its own axis, a spiral shape, uh, endoflagella there. Uh, so it says that there are many hosts uh, for syphilis uh, in India. Uh, so, uh, uh, Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum is what it causes the venereal syphilis. So, this is how we see it under the dark field microscope, not the ordinary microscope. So, the field is dark and the treponemes are seen as uh, silvery uh, spirals in the dark field. Okay. So this is the dark field microscopy. And uh, about the Treponema pallidum, it has many subspecies. So we are interested about venereal syphilis or subspecies pallidum. Uh, and yours and Vigel 
uh, was common among the, uh, the uh, populations who come from Mahiang and Badulang, that area, uh, early days. But now that is also not seen. The difficulty is they have the same kind of serology as a syphilis patient. So uh, even if they say that I have never had any sex, then we have to suspect either jaws or maternal transmission. So we have come into problems like that because if, when they are having serology like that, they question us. So you have to find out why I am having this. Then the easiest one is to check their parents. Uh, that's not a very pleasant task to undertake. Uh, to check these old uh, ammas and tatas. Uh, so, but anyway, if they are pressing us, we do check. But uh, I have found two your patients having the serology of syphilis. When they come, go for these government jobs, uh, it's done routinely, and uh, then they are uh, with this problem. We sign it uh, without any problem after treating. Anyway, we have to treat. Uh, we always don't trust the patients on sexual histories now. That is a, uh, that is actually a, I am telling it's a uh, occupational hazard for us because we see many people are not telling the truth. Then even if they are telling the truth also, we are reluctant to accept it. So sometimes you can see from the patient's face that the patient is uh, very sure about the, the history that he or she is giving. It takes time to uh, read their faces, but anyway, uh, so these are the types of treponemes. And, uh, but it does, uh, do, it's a very slow growth uh, has uh, to compare to any other bacteria. And we can't culture the organism. Uh, we don't culture, it's by serology only we diagnose, you know, the uh, VDRL test. That is what we do on all the pregnant mothers. And then if we found a positive VDR, we do a TPPA test to uh, confirm the diagnosis, okay? Don't uh, say that we don't know about a test called TPPA, some doctors say, uh, but it is uh, the way that we diagnose syphilis, VDR testing, and then to do a TPPA test to confirm the diagnosis. So, in, uh, we have uh, got a certificate from WHO, we got the certificate as a country who have eliminated the eliminated mother-to-child transmission of syphilis and HIV, maybe you all know. Uh, so, that is with great effort, we did actually, so all the samples from all the STD clinic is our advice and we, it's the country uh, guideline. Uh, because the private sector laboratories, we can't rely, always, always in the sense that there are good laboratories. Uh, but anyway, for these uh, people, uh, the pregnant women, we advise them to go to the NMOH office and give their blood. Okay? So then we can treat the mother and uh, prevent the baby getting syphilis. Uh, so it is sexual contact actually. Uh, no other ways of transmission except the congenital syphilis by mother to child transmission. Uh, so that is uh, a disease which should be prevented because they can have uh, the retardation, growth retardation and uh, cardiac defects and these many neurological syndromes they can get. But it is very rare now because we treat the mothers. Okay? So I'm not touching congenital syphilis now. Uh, they can have uh, nasal discharge and flattened nose, nasal bridge at the time of delivery. Uh, and they can have very uh, painful uh, limbs that can have periostitis. And in the, uh, the, they can, if they grow up to adults, then they can have a lot of deformities uh, in the, uh, the previous years, yesterday years. Uh, the people when they had syphilis, they had these uh, uh, things called stigmata, lacunum, uh, the telltale evidence that they have had uh, congenital syphilis. But now I have never yeah, seen yeah. a person having these uh, complications of uh, syphilis, uh, gamata of syphilis even. Uh, 
uh, it's only uh, thing I have seen in the pathology lab of uh, Colombo Medical Faculty. So you also maybe uh, can have a glimpse of uh, Gamata when your pathology uh, lectures. Uh, that's the only place where you can find the Gamata now, as I think. Because uh, they are being treated with many antibiotics, partially treated with antibiotics and the common, uh, this, uh, what do you treat it, the clinical, uh, process, the, the natural uh, history of the disease is changed now. Uh, so the pathogenesis, uh, you may have heard about this uh, early syphilis, I don't like this uh, classification, uh, primary, secondary, you, you call the latent syphilis, early latent are taken as early syphilis. Early syphilis is divided into primary, secondary, and early latent syphilis. Then late syphilis is late latent syphilis and tertiary syphilis. So I was talking about this tertiary syphilis before, about the uh, neurological system and the cardiovascular system. Uh, so it involves skin, bone, uh, like that. But now it is not seen. Uh, but we see primary syphilis, we see secondary syphilis also, and early latent syphilis as well. Uh, today morning also we found a mother's sample having a very high VDRL titer. Uh, and uh, what we did was we called the, uh, the medical officer of health and asked to send the woman tomorrow itself for treatment. We can't take time. Uh, so, like that tertiary syphilis is not very common uh, or we don't diagnose after many years, 30 to 40 years of uh, first infection. And we see latent syphilis because uh, the people who come for these uh, medicals and when we do it routinely, we find a positive TPPA, but there are no symptoms and signs. The word latent means no symptoms and signs, but the serological evidence is there, serology positive. Uh, so that is called latent syphilis. If you are interested, you can learn about secondary syphilis. It's a generalized disease. Uh, it uh, involves many organs and there's a characteristic rash, headache, sore throat, fever and condylomata uh, lata uh, are a, a common uh, symptom. Uh, many of the people uh, misdiagnose it for genital warts. When it occurs in the genital area, it occurs in the genital area mainly, uh, they get confused with genital warts. Uh, I will try to show a diagram. This is the shanker. So if you don't get a chance of uh, seeing a shanker in your appointment, uh, some may, you may not get a chance. And now these days, uh, the, uh, the early infections are very uh, much less because uh, within a meter's distance, you can't do any um, uh, sexual uh, thing, uh, the uh, intercourse, no? So only with their regular partners, they have sex. So this is the picture of a uh, shanker. And you can see the ulcer is clean. And if you uh, touch the, the edge of the ulcer, it's, it has a but, button-like feeling is there. Indurated edge, ulcers are clean, base is clean, painless. So if you get an ulcer in this area, in this, uh, uh, in this size, definitely the patient should have pain. Uh, herpetic ulcers are very painful uh, in, uh, in the difference that the, the syphilitic ulcers are usually painless. And the inguinal lymphadenopathy is very common and the lymph nodes are also painless. Uh, so this is secondary syphilis. Uh, secondary syphilitic rash is there. Unfortunately, I do not have the condylomata lata slide. Sorry about that. So you can search. You all are very rich in knowledge, I think. So search for condylomata lata, images of condylomata lata. Any number you can get. Okay. Uh, so the diagnosis by serology. Uh, we don't have a culture. Uh, VDRL and the TPPA testing for confirmation. Then we treat the, okay, sorry. Uh, so for primary syphilis, uh, we uh, try to demonstrate the organism by dark field, as I showed you earlier, uh, with a scraping taken from the ulcer. 
and we do the VDR. VDRL is usually positive uh, in early syphilis, but maybe negative in syphilitic cases. So we do the VDRL and TPP together. Don't ever ask for VDRL only uh, unless in a in a pregnant patient. Uh, in pregnancy, we do the VDRL only because of the cost. Uh, but in all other cases, you order the VDRL and the TPPA, both together. Uh, treatment uh, for early syphilis, single dose of benzoin penicillin, 2.4 mega units. It's a very painful injection. And as the volume is also high, you give it for into uh, the two sides, uh, buttock. You give it to the buttock. And even if it is very, very painful, uh, three doses one week apart for late syphilis. Uh, you have to screen them for other STIs and HIV. Uh, treatment of sexual partners is necessary. In early syphilis, even though they are not having the infection, you have to give uh, treatment for uh, with benzoin penicillin. So that is called epidemiological treatment. So, congenital syphilis uh, be important to you in this module. Uh, maternal syphilis during pregnancy, untreated. If it is untreated, it can infect the fetus. Okay. If the maternal infection is early syphilis, then the infection, the transmission rate is high. Uh, so, anything like a woman having syphilis can get uh, pregnant, or a woman who is pregnant can get uh, syphilis or a treated uh, syphilis patient can get pregnant. So like that, there are many clinical scenarios, but anyway, there's a pregnancy as well as a disease. So the transmission can occur at any stage, uh, first or second or third trimester, but the effects are more if it gets transferred in the early trimesters because, uh, before organogenesis. Uh, uh, so that is all for syphilis. And this is a disease where we have, we say and we claim that we have eradicated or eliminated, not eradicated, eliminated the trans, uh, mother to child transmission of syphilis and HIV. Okay, and um, this about trichomonasis is not important. Uh, you can't say not important. Only thing, if a patient is having trichomonal vaginitis during pregnancy, it can cause premature delivery. Can cause premature delivery and postpartum uh, postpartum infections in the pelvic cavity. So trichomonas vaginalis, you it's a sexually transmitted disease, and you have to treat the partners also. Presence with the vaginal discharge uh, with a greenish yellow frothy discharge. This is a trichomonas vaginalis organism. Uh, I don't know whether you will be asked to draw a diagram of trichomonas. I, we used to study this diagram uh, for which subject I can't remember. You have a different system now, no, modular system. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a disease you can uh, easily treat with metronidazole 400 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Partner treatment is necessary. Screening for the STI is necessary. Uh, and these common things that condoms will prevent the transmission. So other things which are considered as sexually transmissible infections, uh, candidiasis is also not uh, solely sexually transmitted disease, uh, but if a woman is having vaginal candidiasis, a sexual partner can get a uh, candida balanitis because of the, uh, the touch and it can transit if the partner is having uh, diabetes, then it can become a very uh, prominent disease. And this is how more many people are identified with diabetes. Okay? And there is pubis infection. Uh, it's with the, this, uh, the pubic lice uh, and uh, scabies. In Sri Lanka, the pubic lice infections are rare. Only among the prisoners I have seen this. Uh, but uh, strangely, uh, when I went for my postgraduate training, among these white people, there were people who are having pubis infection. Because I don't, I think they don't bathe uh, regularly like the Sri Lankan people. 
and they use these um, the toilet habits are uh, different from us and uh, that may be one reason and they are uh, usually the 50 percent of the men who are coming to the more than 50 percent of the people who are coming to the estate clinic are msms or men having sex with men they drink they have sex drugged or this is the the usual uh, the population who come to STD clinics in those countries. But uh, in here, uh, we see this uh, clean, clean, cleanliness problems uh, among the prisoners mainly. Well, uh, comparatively clean, the Sri Lankans. Scabies is also not uh, seen very fre uh, frequently now. But we saw as medical students, any child, children, there were many children who are having uh, scabies. Now the personal care is improved actually over the years. The people use soap, uh, so like that we have actually improved. Uh, so uh, what is your role? Uh, having high degree of suspicion, referral to STD clinic, screening for other STIs, syndromic management if facilities are not available, so you are permitted to do anything. Make sure you do the HIV testing on everybody. Okay? As medical students, you have to learn that uh, taking the STIs as a differential diagnosis is the mainstay of diagnosing STIs. Uh, and I have this, but I don't think that I have time to go. STIs and pregnancy. So I have covered up many things the, in that. So this... Um, this stuff is not so, but I will send this presentation to you. Again, the same thing I have done. This is, I, I am talking only about the pregnancy outcomes or how it affects the pregnancy. Uh, it just me in pregnancy. So this is a child who is having neonatal herpes, skin, eye and this syndrome. So uh, some people have only this SCM, uh, skin, eye and uh, skin, eye manifestations. But some, uh, some kids get uh, neurological involvement. Uh, so neurological involvement is, uh, have, uh, gives rise to a lot of complications. In the scalp, uh, so with uh, sometimes it features scalp electrodes and um, uh, this uh, the intrauterine procedures sometimes can cause this infection in the scalp. So disseminated disease, all these things I have covered actually. This uh, presentation I have uh, made for the diploma trainees in venereology not for medical students, but I didn't include HIV. Uh, what uh, you should learn about HIV is all the mothers should be tested for HIV uh, before uh, 12 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, at any stage is okay, but uh, preferably before uh, 12 weeks of pregnancy. And then uh, we have to start antiretroviral therapy uh, irrespective of their immune status or anything. You have to start treatment and continue treatment till their life. Uh, avoid breastfeeding is what we practice now. I might change in the future because if they are virally suppressed, there is no chance of transmitting to the baby. So the things may change in the future. But uh, at the moment, we are not uh, allowing the mothers to breastfeed their kids. Uh, so uh, recommendations so we uh, formula feeds are given to them. Uh, free of charge till one year, up to one year, when the child up to one year, it's given by a uh, NGO actually, not by the uh, the government. But when this NGO uh, is not no more active or anything, then the government can consider giving them uh, formula feeds, uh, the, uh, the milk uh, packets uh, for poor people only, not for the people who can afford. So uh, this is how the breastfeeding, prophylactic ARP uh, for four to six weeks, 
uh, and they are tested uh, and we exclude uh, the HIV by testing them uh, uh, for about four to eight weeks. We do the testing on and off and then at the before 18 months of uh, 18 months or so we do an hour. We have a DNA PCR for, um, for HIV. So we can exclude HIV in kids uh, during a short interval. The treatments available and uh, that is all I have for this presentation. Um, you all, uh, you all got the, you all, did you all uh, write the presentation? Uh, the notes or should I send the presentation to you? Uh, madam, if you can, can you email the presentation? To whom? To the, the, uh, the department? To the demonstrator. Yes, madam. Uh, to the department. Uh, there yes, was a girl uh, called me. Nishara. Nishara, yes, Nishara. I will send the presentation to Nishara. Nishara then. Okay, madam. Okay. So Thank you, hope madam. You have a nice sleep uh, during the, the post lunch time. Uh, are there any questions by anybody? Excuse me, madam. I have a question. Okay. Uh, Tell me. Madam, uh, madam in syphilis, uh, as TPPA is specific for syphilis and VDRL, why do we do both tests rather than doing only TPPA? The TPP will decide whether this is syphilis or not. But to have an idea about the, uh, the stage of the disease, we do the VDR. And to measure the response of the disease to the medicines we give, we need the VDR. For example, if the VDRL is, R, we say it's given in R, R16. So we give the treatment and measure the VDR. And if it is R2 or something, there's a fourfold decline, only we say, that the uh, person has responded. Only if they have a positive VDRL, we can say that the patient has responded for therapy. It's only to measure the response to therapy and to decide about the some uh, uh, in very high teeters, we know that it should be early syphilis and there's no demarcation uh, line to say early and late by the VDRL. Uh, but uh, if it is very high VDRL, very high theta, like 512 and all, so we know that it is should be early syphilis. And to measure the response of the disease to the to penicillin, only we do the VDRL. Okay, I'll thank satisfy you, the answer. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, then thank you very much for your listening and any problem you can, uh, uh, you can uh, send uh, any email or anything. I am my, um, now the screen sharing has stopped now. So I'm Jayadari at yahoo.com. Jayadari is J-A-Y-A-D-A-R-I-E at yahoo.com. All simple. Send me if you have any doubts. So I will send this to Nishara. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Okay. Welcome.